Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, today my role to introduce our keynote speaker is somewhat unnecessary because our speaker needs no introduction in the world of archaeology. Marie-Louise Sørensen is Professor of European Prehistory and Heritage Studies at the University of Cambridge. And many of us know her through her extensive contributions related to the Bronze Age, especially excavations of the fabulous site of Sashalombata. She has also given huge contribution to archaeological theory in aspects related to gender and link between materiality and identity, as well as practices of memorialization and monuments. She has contacts and uh, managed scientific networks across Europe, from Denmark, where she started her work, to Croatia and many other countries. We, EAA, have recognized her immense contribution also to heritage studies, and that is why she received a European Archaeological Heritage Prize in 2014. However, her influence reach scope and interest reach far beyond that, and she is also directing a project on early colonial expansion in Cape Verde. Uh, our intention to have keynote speakers uh, also is related to this year's motto, and we are trying to connect teams of our keynote speeches to this year's motto, which is networking. We chose this motto even before COVID-19 pandemics, but recent developments only made it more relevant. Using experience of this contemporary crisis, where all our networks are being questioned and remodeled from our the most intimate one, like with our families, up to this annual meeting, which is taking virtual form, our speaker will re-examine our concepts of human interaction and notion of networks in the past. Her reflections will be grounded in her Bronze Age research, especially at the Bronze Age uh, Tel Etzas Halambat. Unfortunately, this year, we are not in Hungary, so we will not be able to have unique experience of visiting this magnificent <coughs> site. But I cannot imagine better presenter of one of the many scientific implications of that research. Therefore, my honor and privilege is to announce Marie Louise Sørensen. Marie, floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. It was very lovely. Very generous introduction, and I'm extremely pleased and feel very honored for that you invited me to give this talk. And it has, of course, become an even more demanding and challenging, but also inspiring thing to do it in this very weird period we are in. For many of us, I think for all of us, going to the EAA is about meeting people, friends and colleagues, and sometimes also people you didn't know about, it's always exciting to meet and listen to the young students. So it is very regretful that we can't do it this year. But also I think they have an extra expectation of us to try to think about archaeology and sharing that thinking in a way which cross-cut those personal relations. So I will try and go through my presentation with you. As you can see on my title slides, I have now two titles. The first one was before I had started really working on it, where I was concerned about the reductive tendency of language. I was concerned about us simplifying the past and how we can react to that and the challenge of capturing social relation in actually 2D. But as I've thought more about it, I was getting concerned about trying to ground it. And for that, I therefore wanted to use the Bronze Age sites to actually think about network, networking and interaction, bottom up in terms of how one experiences it or might see it through a particular community. So I made you a paper of six points, and this is really meant as a as an opening up for discussion. It's not about me having an authoritative view of this. I, I want to think with you. I want to try to scrutinize some of the way of thinking and whether we can use various type of challenges to move forward together. So my very first point is going to be about our some of our challenges. My second very brief point is about network. And I'll briefly 
just mention people. I'll then share three maps as three ways of representing. And then I'll try to think through some of the issues through the Bronze Age tell. And then at the end, very briefly, uh, a, a concluding reflection. So challenges. It is very obvious, as already the, uh, said, we are at a time of challenge. We are at a time where our relationship to others, from the intimate to the most wider, to the stranger, to the people you pass in the street, has been open up for discussion, for concern. Certainly people are risk. Certainly people are your support system, etc. So at experiential and in many cases existentialistic levels, we are being challenged to think and rethink and remodel our social relations. And in various ways, I think that also will challenge how we think about relations in the past. <clears throat> so the pandemic and our experience of that is now part of the thing we use to draw on when we understand. At the same time, over recent years, there have been various movements which also challenge our production of knowledge, how we produce knowledge and what we take for granted and what we bring into in terms of pre-understanding. And I would particularly focus on or emphasize decolonization and particularly the decolonization of the mind, the way we think and the thing we take for granted, whether that should be taken for granted and what luggage of past that brings into our thinking. I think that's an enormous challenge. It's not clear how one was, would respond to it, but it's important, I think, to recognize that it is a genuine challenge. There are also claims about cultural appropriation, which warns in some way or uh, challenges the chair picking of other cultures, items and cultural forms that you cannot just go into other culture and take out what you would like to use in various kind of context. And that also could maybe apply to how we think, use ethnography to think about past. The issue there about our preparation, which I think we should maybe develop some sensitivity about. And then finally, the concept of reframing, particularly in terms of history and in terms of interpretation, which uh, particularly Black Lives Matters have brought up, that sense of it's not about a uh, subjective versus an objective history. It's about history, understanding history from different point of views, that there is not just one way of understanding and accounting for and, and outlining history. I think in various ways, these three things together, these three movements are really very constructive, also very difficult challenges to our production of knowledge. It's challenges to what we take for granted. It's substantial challenges to the language we use and how meaning are already built into the terminology and challenge in terms of embracing the implication of the kind of thing we say of the past that we are constructing. My second point, and many of you will know much more about this than I, but that are just about networks. <clears throat> So the terms of the conference, network, networking and interaction, there we have to recognize that they're not just sim simple descriptive terms, but they also tend to introduce a range of assumptions, ideas of causality and general interpretation. And that this makes them powerful, but also potential troublesome or difficult. They are not just descriptive. They do something when they are used. And some of the obvious challenges is about how in this language we can embrace diversity and different kinds of networks or interactions beyond economy and trade, for example, how it can incorporate time in a non-linear manner rather than linear, or how in at all it engages with time, how we value and weight the relationship between agents and nodes on the one hand and the links and relationships between them. So for example, is a prime focus the agent interacting or the links between them? Or can those two actually be separated? So the language tools, and I would talk about, refer to network, networking and interactions as language tools, 
they are in the use of them, we have to balance the usefulness, how they help us to understand versus the burden of presumption, assumption, understanding, simplification, etc., that they bring with them. They are not just tools for ordering data. They are tools which create certain kind of meaning avenues out of that data. So network, exciting, but also a challenge in terms of the problematics. However, a third point, which is about people, However we criticize networks, we have to remember that people are social. They do create networks and they do interact. Whether our methods can act good enough, well attuned to what those interactions are about, that's a different thing. But people do interact. They do relate to each other. And it's important there to recognize that, that the reasons for that are wide ranging. And in our analysis, we often capture only a very narrow range of those regions. And they range from biological reproduction to gossip. And I have to say, I like the idea of gossip because I think it's such an important social mechanism and it's very often totally kept out of sight. So the challenge when we try to interpret those obvious social relations is in terms of motivation. How do we understand the motivation? How do we make them rational rather than chaotic, complex, diverse, etc.? And do are we critical enough about our ability to identify, identify who or what were the agents or mode? Who defined those agents? How do we define them? And on what grounds? How do we define these other agents? And for example, in terms of listening to the current discussions on ontology, there may be that agents are not all the time sites of people or objects. They're also more wide ranging. And do we need to, or is that not helpful to listen to those? And again, what are the implications? What are the impacts of those networks? We don't just reconstruct network. We should also use that to think about the impact and the results and consequences, how it ties people together in various ways. So there are really substantial issues at play when we start to talk about network or interactions. So I just wanted to share three maps. One is the map of the distribution of health that sea sort, but it could be a map a distribution map of anything. This is a very uh, normal, conventional way of archaeology is to present data and to present spatial relationship. But in this map, in this type of map, the relationships are not mapped. They are in our discussion of the map, but not presented in the map. So it's only indicated, for example, by a group or a limit or something like that. But that is... So that is a map which focuses on the physical presence of something at a particular point in landscapes. And then it generates interpretation of various kind. The kind of network analysis that we now start to see have shifted the emphasis from the points to the relationships or the links between the points. And they are, in a very interesting way, totally abstract. It's very interesting that the language is often about relationship, but this line is, of course, not a relationship. Relationships are not like that. They're not just a straight line. So it represents something in quite abstracted way, particular when we take it away from the modern communications where networks are used to, which networks are used to analyze, to into past landscapes with the messiness of movements and links of relationships. So methodological very strong, but actually much more abstract than they might sense. They very easily look very precise. This map is a painting that Chris Evans, my husband and I have at home. It's Australian Aboriginal map showing the constellation and underneath that in just, you can't see it here, very faintly in the sand is drawn out the underwater uh, 
causes. So this is a map which is even more abstract than the network. It shows the constellation as if it has connections, which it doesn't have. And it sh doesn't show the ground, the surface. It shows under the ground. So it shows above and below. And they use that connection as a way of mapping a guidance. So here we get more towards an ontological uh, difference and towards maybe a cognitive map, a way of thinking about the world and using mapping as a way of guiding yourself and presenting yourself and presenting your understanding. So three different ways of using maps. Each of them is a 2D presentation. None of them have true dynamics, but they have different degrees of abstraction. <clears throat> so let me take you to a site. I found that actually thinking about what the issues were, I had to ground it. And the Bronze Age Tell, apart from being by now my favorite kind of site, is very useful to think with because they're probably of all among the sites which are most typically seen to be part of network. They're the Bronze Age Tells or Tells come in as one of the, the top candidates. They are presented as spheres of interaction. They are about interaction in our traditional interpretation of them. So let me just remind you of some of the characteristics. They're settlements with houses built upon each other through time, which means time is present. They are shared modes of fashion or templates for settlements over wide regions. They're densely inhabited, so there's a strong need for social regulation and a strong expression of interaction within sites. And they're centrally placed very often on major rivers, and that is one of our sort of core ideas of a link is, of course, a river, the routes of communication. So they have some of the, many of those traditional elements of a network. So... Let's go to the site. Shashalombata, which had things been normal, we would have hoped you had all come out to visit. It is a Bronze Age tell, early and middle Bronze Age, uh, about 30 kilometers south of Budapest on the river Danube. You can see it here on the map. Sorry. And the director, Magdalena Visse from the Matrica Museum, Joanna Sofia from the University of Southampton, and myself. And it is, in many, many ways, a classic tell. And the map I showed you give a classic sense of a network of these particular settlement types. We need to look closer. And I'll do that at three levels. I'll, one, talk about uh, the big general map. Then I'll talk about the evidence of imports to the site itself. And then, thirdly, I will talk at the level of interaction with insight. And I'll try to use these three levels to think about the challenge we have of understanding interaction and networks. This is another distribution map, example of the distribution of tells. It's by Alexander Gavin from her very important study of the metalworking evidence on tells. And when you start looking into it, you see that not all tells have evidence of metal working. So the traditional model of tells being lined up along the river and playing an important central role in the Bronze Age economy based on the exchange and trade in topmost metal actually fragment a bit. These sides don't seem to do the same thing. If I had been able to produce a map which showed the subsistence basis, I think we would also find differences. I think we would find the tells up in this area being much more focused on using the river and riverine resources than we have down here at Shashlambata. So at different levels in terms of the economy and interaction, the idea of a network based of in based on nodal point interacting with each other, it's not sustainable. We cannot, we don't have evidence to say that. At the same time, 
It is clear that in terms of a template, a way of life, these sites are very similar and they're different from sites around them. So at the level of culture in terms of ecological thinking, in some way a very traditional old fashioned way of thinking about culture as cultural behavior and norms and value, at that level, these could be think, thought about as a network. They have great similarities. So the network become much more about cultural behavior, about norms, meaning, ways of life, then it actually is about exchanges. We cannot see anything going up and down those lines that presumably were, but what we mainly see is something which have to do with communication around cultural behavior. So that I think is a really interesting challenge uh, in terms of two mechanistic understanding of networks. So if we then move inside the site and think about what evidence do we have inside the site of its role in networks, what imports do we have? And this referred to the first phase, which is about um, six level or five levels and about uh, 90 centimeter of stratigraphy, about 323,000 liter of soil. So it's a lot. Our evidence of imported material and material coming in is actually surprisingly, and to be honest, we found that ourselves slightly shockingly limited. In the pottery, and we have almost 150,000 shirts, we have less than half a percent of that is imported. And what is imported comes from the Vacha culture, so the regional culture group or neighboring groups. It's not from far away. We have some imported stone, we have 89 pieces. Most of them are for informal tools and they come from various regional outcrops. We have about 476 pieces of flint. <clears throat> they come from the Buddha area of Budapest, which is only about 30 kilometers north, not more than one or two days walk. And many of those are sickles. We do have 12 pieces of amber and they must have come from the Baltic, but it's very few considering the time span of those 323 liters of soil. Um, it's our own substantial evidence of contact outside the regional area. The Feuillants, we have 17 pieces. They're very similar to types in the Carpathian basis at the time, no suggestions of any particular connections. The bronzes, we have 18, and by bronzes, I mean so sort of tiny little pieces of broken off pin and so on. There's nothing really spectacular at all. The material, the bronze itself is from alpine sources, but where we can identify the types, they are Carpathian. So it's surprisingly, I don't know, shockingly, but maybe or far as initially almost that, limited evidence of external contact on this very prominent tell. So let me just zoom in on the ceramics for a minute. That, as I said, we have very little uh, import. We have less than half a percent and it generally comes from the encrusted ware culture. Again, Shashan Bata is here. But we have some evidence of valuation of curiosity, of some kind of awareness of that other ceramic. And that expressed itself in local ceramic, which adopt or adjust or imitate some element of the pottery from over here. And that I think in terms of network or interaction, actually bring up this wonderful sense of, a, of an interaction, which is of the mind, which is culture, which is about how people think and what they're curious about. It's not about trade. It's not a simple line, a link on the landscape where something moved in one direction. It is something more complex about human psychology, about human social and cultural behavior. So I think very challenging in terms of how we bring into a systematic analysis of the types of interaction. But one, because it's difficult to fit in, 
one we have to be careful about not ignoring. So although we only have few of that, it's less than half a percent, it is a very important aspect of how this community interacted with the wider world. <coughs> so if you sort of try to very briefly think about the evidence of trade, and I focus on trade because so much uh, focus on network has been about objects where you can identify that they're moving around. So at an informal level, we can say that Shashal and Bata conform to a way of life that was shared in the Capetian basis, and more specifically to the region of the Vacha culture, where it doesn't just share the settlement form, but also the mortuary practices and ceramics tradition. So they are sharing. They're not isolated community. They are sharing. They're conforming. And that implies very intensive cultural transmission. But how is that taking place? So it seems to take place through sharing and copying and talking and gossiping about how neighbors do things and how people a little bit further away do things. It's about, it's about a very human, very, very social aspect of the network. It's one which is not mechanical and is at some level abstract to the sense that culture is abstract, but it's very, very real in terms of affecting the way people lived and the kind of things they strive towards and what inspired them in how they produced culture life. So at that informal level, we would have to say that Shashul Mbata is very well incorporated and conforming with cultural values in a wider area. But when it actually comes to objects of trade, as I just told you, there are far fewer objects imported into the material, into the area, into the site than we have expected. And most of them just come from the re their, their own region or just the neighbors within the Capetian area. So very lovely, interesting challenge to our understanding. I'll try to just take you one more level down in terms of how intimate this is. So I'm looking at the beads and pendants from the same face. And I focus on that because uh, I find them very interesting because they're so personal objects. So if they're prestige or identity or value, special value, it may be expressed here. But actually most of the material is from natural. they are shells, teeth and bone from just the local area, my green area. There's a few things which are from just on the side. And then there are, and I'm sorry, this era should go up to amber. Then there are a few things which are cultured. They're not, they're made as beads. And there we have amber, fayence, and a few of the branches. And the amber is the only one, I'm not really sorry this area has moved, but the amber is the only one which really takes us out of the Carpathian Basin. The branches does in terms of material, but not in terms of the types of beads. They are made actually still in the Carpathian Basin. So what I find the most interesting in this group, partly because our idea of tell is a very cultured, sophisticated, and then when you look at what they carry, what objects they have on them, they are natural, they are local, or rather, I, I call them local non-domestic. They are from just outside the comfort zone of the site and its field. It's just on the edge of that where you have materials that you're engaging with. And I will try to just show that in more detail. So on the background, you see there's kind of those pendants made out of animal bones or teeth. And then we have two examples, which are you find very, very interesting, very revealing. This is a bead made to look, cut out of a cow's jaw, made to look like a roe deer canine. So the significance of that association with the wild is so that you imitate it, even if you don't have the bead, you use another material to still create that association. And that I think brings in an interaction which is very intriguing for us. What is it 
that that area outside the domestic, outside the uh, utilized routine area provide. And that's where one might uh, think a little bit about some of the ontological challenge about how in their worldview there is a world there which matter, which are drawn, which are used in various ways. And very interesting, it's not the river that provides that. It is the forest at the edge, or presumably at the edge of the fields. So again, I find it it's so intriguing when the data tells us, give us that little glimpse in a complex world, which is not neat, it's not a simple network. Their interaction, which are quite abstract in their in their ontology and how they're formed. Okay, let me take us to the third level. Uh, and I'm sorry, I could talk about this forever. I realize I have limited time. This is within the site. We have different kinds of spaces and therefore also interaction within the site. And this give a glimpse of the household spaces and the open communal spaces. And they are very important in terms of introducing an insight into different behavior, which is dictated and resulting different kinds of spaces. And this is where the site become much, much more informative than it becomes about network or interaction at the other, at the level of external import or even the tell phenomena. This shows you of a wonderful house, one of our wonderful houses, but also this streaking sense of what happens in that interface between one kind of space, one kind of social entity and other kinds of spaces and different kinds of social entities. And we have tried to use the concept of the ontological challenge of social living, but basically it is a challenge to live in that density. It's a challenge about how you interact. And we do see that, uh, in different way in the material, in terms of what it kept clean, what is dirty, what is regulated, how regulation breakdowns, etc. Very, very interesting aspects, which I can't go into now. But I think that it's clear that there is a level, a low level of continuous interaction between different kinds of spaces, which also produces different kinds of spaces and which involve movement. So. It is unclear whether network is a useful method for that, but awareness of interaction is indeed very, very helpful. So let me just introduce the, another aspect of that inside interaction, because you need to, you need to tell you have horizontal, as I just explained, but you also have vertical interaction. So you have neighbors and ancestors at the same time. So in this slide, you see the half, but this is a half on many faces. Every time the house is pulled down to level out, the half is maintained and rebuilt as part of the next house. So within the half, which are interior to the houses, you get that continuous link back through time through generation before you, to houses before you, or potentially to ancestors. I don't quite like the word ancestor, but it is something similar to that. And it brings in time, I think, in interesting way, that we have times um, as a continuous linear phenomena all the time, accumulation and change, etc. But we also have time as a nonlinear dynamic, as a recall as a means of being, being conscious of times, of bringing up memory in the making of the next stage of the uh, open, you are consciously recalling and remaking something which has been. And that is a dynamic of, we can see on this side, and I think one could think it through on different kinds of sites, that sense of the non-linear dynamic of time and how we bring that to networks. So, very, very briefly in terms of concluding reflections, um, the cartographic tradition that I've weekly, so weekly referred to 
It's a practice of visualizing and representing past social relation in 2D that has been a totally dominant and familiar way of viewing archaeology, but also therefore of understanding. They do give, they are the basis of interpretations. That tradition, representation come with problematic assumptions and tendency, and in particular had the tension, tendency towards understanding social relations in terms of hierarchy. When we look at those maps of differences, they have a, very often assumptions of hierarchy of relations between those points of value and rational behavior that this is placed there because of this and so on. So they are not just representations without any agendas. And I think what we are experiencing, and this get back to my first point in terms of challenge, is that the ideas and worldviews which have been embedded in that way of thinking, it's something we have been challenged to question. We should not just take it for granted that hierarchy exists or expresses itself in that way, that people are rational in certain ways. At the same time, it is clear, and it's something we must keep links to, that people are social. So I think, therefore, that the challenge we may be facing is how we move between top-down approaches and bottom-up approaches, with the top-down approaches very often resulting in lack of sensitivity. They cannot be sensitive to the socially unique or the specific sites. The lack of details and black boxing, particularly around uh, indigenous understanding, if one wants to talk about indigenous in terms of past, about cultural values and about abstract motivations. But it's the same bottom-up approaches uh, makes comparison very difficult and very difficult to reach generalization. So you might question what's the point of knowledge if we cannot generalize from it. And it can also lead to fragmentations. So either of these approaches are not totally fulfilling the aims of producing good knowledge. And my suggestions, and this is very good to do a suggestion where you sort of end of your lecture so you don't have to be committed to anything, I put question mark after suggestion because I don't know what one would suggest. But I was slightly curious about whether we could explore the idea of fossil logic and fossil methods a bit better to understand diversity and complex past co communities in such a way that they remain complex and diverse rather than becoming simplified to our understanding. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Marie Louise. It was it was fantastic lecture as always, and and so so thick with meaning and 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 uh, good food for thoughts that I I am sure that uh, more than four hundred fifty of our listeners will have many questions to follow, but uh, since I'm here, I will uh, abuse my position as as. Uh, Announcer to to ask a few myself. Uh, of course, you touched here many different things, and in in these uh, troubled times, of course, we need to reconsider the whole concept of networking and everything. And all all, all of that jumps to our minds. All of things that we were probably troubled years ago, and now we see uh, uh, how uh, inefficient some of our tools are. First of all. Uh, terminology, I think you pointed very well that network is becoming as vague and powerful term as culture. Everybody uses it, nobody knows what it actually means, or actually we all mean different things by that, but we continue to use it all over the place, sort of assuming that other people will understand what we mean by it. Uh, but what's your opinion? Because some people says we shouldn't use it we should use something else but in terms of for example um, uh, ethical names and and terms like culture or terms like celts or something if we abandon tool it could be dangerous because people may pick it up and use it as a weapon uh, in terms of fill it in with a different content and 
then it becomes even uh, more difficult to to go through it. What's what's your opinion? What we should do with our terminology when we describe uh, uh, human relationships in the past? Yeah, <clears throat> I think. Uh yeah, kind of like two dimension to it. We need language to, to both to ana analyze and to communicate. But language very, very quickly gets saturated with particular meaning. So sometimes one has to renew language to develop new words. Uh, but I think sometimes you, instead of developing new language, you could also go back to your concept and understand the roots and some of the meaning which has which is slipping into your use of it because you're not thinking about it and i think culture is interesting because that had almost got out of fashion because it became almost polluted with a whole range of intentions and political meaning and and implications so maybe sometime if you if you need to use a word and you need to make it central you do need to clean it up a little bit it's like you have to think about the implication the word has unless you make it clear that that is not what you you that is not what you want to use it for so in some way just now i find maybe culture is becoming a little bit more opening again than the word network although network is very interesting and have a lot of potential to uh, in terms of analysis it also comes from sphere of soci sociological analysis, which are very, very modern. So I, I think I think in that way, the decolonization of the mind is an interesting challenge because it really asks us to think really, really deeply about our language. Uh, that And it's very uncomfortable in a way. It's a lot of things you're taking for granted. It's the prestige and privilege you're taking for granted that you have suddenly have to be self-critical about. But I think it could also be freeing up. Uh, that critical stance can help you to be more thoughtful in your engagement with language. Thank you. It's. It's. Um, I think it's. It's. It, it also opens completely another box. I've, I've been thinking about your words now, and of course we have to... This this could be a, a subject of, on its own. Uh, I have thousands more questions, but I've seen that some of the questions are now appearing in our uh, chat, and John Chapman asked the first one. And the question, is a tell with no evidence of metalworking not a nodal point? You seem to imply this. Surely networks connect different kinds of sites. Yes, and I think that uh, that is what one has to embrace because the traditional model with presenting the site is actually all essentially the same, that they would tell and they conform to a certain role in terms of particularly the metal trade. And what we are learning through Alexander's work is Yes, there are tells, but they're not tells in the same way. And I think that is uh, what I also try to say, that one can critique the idea of the network of tells, but in the end, they also have things in common. So maybe it's worth thinking what it is that is important. What is the important thing to have in common? And what is the important types of relationship they might have had with each other? And it's not just about trade, it's also about sharing in, in other ways. So it was more my concern about how often the discussion of tells as network have been focused on on the trade rather than other ways, other kind you trading with your mind as well as with objects. Uh, but thank you to John for the comment. Yes, and and I and I also think that I, I fully understand what John means in terms of we often see these these maps connected with the similar dots. So there is a net of tells, but we know yeah. that there are so many different uh, ways that people lived in, in, in the same landscape at the same time. And somehow we ignore all these differences in, in, in terms of networking. But there is another question from Eric Rune. 
who says, uh, I found your observations or networks of similarity as replicating normative notions of culture and plea for fuzzy logic fascinating. However, networks can incorporate intensities of connections and can, although it is hard, be used to capture flows and developments in connections and intensities over time. Do you think such additional tools can breed new life in the more cartographic traditions you mentioned? So that's a comment from Eric. Uh, I think that this, uh, and I know he do this kind of work and do it very well and very interesting. I think that is, uh, uh, it's very exciting if from within archaeology we can see that we need networks to do more, to do things which are more subtle and more dynamic. And I think in particular, uh, that sense of that it's uh, the where the dynamic sits and if they can make, if they can work with ways of understanding the uh, intensity of connections in way which show them or open up for the possibility that they are not just directional and in terms of density, but they have other dynamics. I think then they could help us to thinking. I don't think there will ever be uh, the only way of thinking about interaction, but I think it could be a powerful tool, but it has to develop. It has to embrace some of the differences between modern life and a prehistoric life. Thank you. And uh, I was myself personally impressed with two metaphors, which are which are very powerful in your, um, in your uh, lecture. The first is constellation, it's a beautiful thing. Of course, when, when you think about the stars, Content is actually in the eye of the beholder. It's actually 2D image creating all kinds of different 3D ideas, which are more related to individual mindsets than, than to this in, initial 2D starter. And I think it's it's a very much uh, uh, like what we do when we see all these cartographic representations of our nodes, networks, and everything. We see different things. And sometimes it's even when even when you made such a map, and all of us at one point did, yeah. you think that you are actually sending a particular message because you know what it means. People when see this kind of thing will see something else. So uh, sometimes we do these things in, in, in terms of putting things on the map, uh, thinking that we are actually... Uh, sending very clear message, not trying to, to uh, elaborate in, in text or speech. And then suddenly yeah. you realize that people are getting something completely different from the same picture that you have done. And another thing, uh, I have seen that a lot of people are uh, actually addressing it. Gossip, it's a wonderful thing. We all forget about it. And, <laughs> but I, I come from a small, from a small town. So we all know that strict social strategies are uh, in, in power all the time to prevent mm -hmm. or even to induce gossip. Because mm -hmm. gossip actually has much more influence on actual life than official code of conduct, which is yeah. in power in, in these places. And I think it's it's very intriguing to think about these communities as, as uh, such. I see many people are actually... Um, um, referring on that and, and our editor actually is uh, sort of referring to El Yahar, an anthropologist studied the way gossips and women shut mm -hmm. and drive local economies and create some uh, yeah. ideas. Uh, so I think that your lecture will have so many consequences, but I'm looking for uh, other, other questions. Not yet. Can I just comment on the thing you said about maps? Because I think you it's very interesting to appreciate our own self, the sense that knowledge is obvious, that you produce map and you think it's obvious what you produce. And I remember now when I work in Hungary, I can recognize a European map without coastal lines. But when I was younger and hadn't worked in Hungary, I despaired whenever I went to a lecture and just showed a part of Europe and there was a coast. There were not a coast. If there were not a coast, <laughs> I, I did had no idea which part of Europe they were showing. I didn't understand. Now I can always recognize the line of the Danube. Uh, and that sense of just on level of maps, 
that for, for each of us, it's so self-evident what landscape we had flattened out as a 2D thing. But it is not so evident. There's a lot of there's a lot of embodied knowledge of those landscapes we present as archaeologists. So uh, I, I love maps, but I thought it was interesting to think about the problems as well. Oh yeah, definitely. And uh, of course, when you're talking about this, you don't have imported things in 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 the hotel, but you have seen that there is an important interaction with the neighboring groups and and conformity or means uh, collective yeah. uh, ideology of of this whole area. Uh, yeah. They are well conformed, obviously. So it it seems that individual experience of people who are contacting with these groups is somehow transformed into community knowledge and practice without actually importing objects. It's really, I think it's wonderfully fascinating in terms of us understanding the archaeological record that, of course, they are interacting. Clearly, they, you know, tells are giving up roughly the same time. There's a dynamic there which is really very widely shared, but it's not one which is primarily expressed through material object is expressed through ways of living and that's much more difficult to capture you cannot sort of count it up very easily oh yeah yeah that's it it's really fuzzy catherine actually sent a, a question and she says the sort of multiscolar research you are advocating is complex but necessary this is maybe a simple question but do you think there can be a shared method for this sort of sliding between scales, or we will have to reinvent it for every site or region uh, or research question. Now, Catherine, I, I think that is, uh, I think I just hinted at that challenge at the end, and I know I was sort of checking out and not trying to commit myself. I think that is exactly the challenge, because if every site becomes unique, it is not useful. In some way, we have to find ways of advancing our research methodologies so those kind of appreciation of scales can be applied widely rather than having to be reinvented. I think you're putting your finger on an important point, which I think comes also from the bottom-up approach. It has the danger of everything becoming so unique and self-defined that it actually doesn't matter for others. And if our purpose of doing archaeology is also to learn about the past, not just about your own site, then we have to find a way of, uh, of developing methods or shared methods, which I hope could be appreciating those different kinds of scales in which social life is, is, is expressed and experienced. Uh, but I'm not quite so I can see how to do it from my side. I don't know how one takes not necessarily my methods, but my concern and bring it to a more comparative perspective. But I think it would be possible and I think it would be helpful because otherwise we end up in an archaeology of extremes with people who work very generalized or people who work extremely localized and they don't speak together. I think it's it's actually very important. This is why we have meetings like this and lectures like this. And uh, of course, I fully agree. What we perceived in, in later period in Iron Age is that models that we are actually trying to apply do not work. Uh, how to how to modify them? Well, I think it's it's your approach is actually key is go to the bottom up, go back to the individual communities. And then from our experience from different communities form actual model, which will be based on individual communities, not on some sort of general idea how things should work. And then you go to the individual communities and stretch them to, to conform to our idea how they should work. Because you know, science is always right, reality is sometimes wrong. This is what we tend to do a lot of uh, a lot of times. Uh, and another thing, imitation, which we uh, the, 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 this example of yours is it's fantastic. I mean, deer do the, yeah. the, the cows do. It. So people say, these people do not really understand what it's all about. I think it's contrary actually that people do understand much better what it's all about. 
Because if you would find a deer tooth, you would not, you cannot be sure that people who are actually wearing a beer, deer tooth and in Saskalombata are aware what it means in another community. Here, by imitating stuff, you actually show that you are aware of the meaning, you are aware of the message you want to produce. So imitating actually means that you are much closer. This is what, what you are telling us all the time. It doesn't mean that you have to import stuff. If you imitate stuff, it means that you are much more aware of what it means or this general ideology yeah. than, than uh, actually bringing in the actual object. Yeah. yeah, we have two examples. I find them fascinating. It's, it's really fascinating. And also this ancestry as a way of formalizing system of inheriting, the actual inheriting role within the community. It doesn't yeah. have to be genetic, but your rebuilding of hearts means that we are here. We are here to stay. We are inheriting what whoever lived here. We are taking over, and it means sort of stability as opposed to relation with neighbors, which brings yeah. social dynamics, development of social structure. I mean, even now we have this thing that we have private room. Even if you are good friends with someone, you probably never saw their bedroom. But in in many languages, for example, in mine, you have living room and reception room as as yeah. the, as the same thing. So you would you would have your friends or neighbors or somebody coming to your living room, and you would display whatever you want to display, whatever message you want to send out. But your private things are going to be hidden regardless of, of the depth of, of uh, the experience. And there is another question by Caroline Gruyer. I wonder about the raw material import versus fully made product import. What are your thoughts on how these types of outside interactions compare with each other? Uh, do they have different implications and impacts and how would they differ? Yes, uh, I think that again is it's a very powerful question because that could mean that one also have to differentiate between what objects do and the motivation. So I think, for example, with the flint, it is quite likely that you have a group of workers who they get the work raw material and they do the met they make the flint tools on site. We have a lot of little debris. So there one can see one kind of interaction where it's about bringing the raw material into site and use it for making objects. Where if you get the amber, I think you get them in as beads. It is as objects. So I think one could draw a distinction between objects and the kind of association they have and raw materials. And I think that distinction would even apply to uh, some of the import from of ceramic for the other groups. It's very interesting. They're not that many, but they are so distinctly different. So it's very interesting how they've thought about those. Uh, and they so that's not so there's the, the difference between imitation and an actual foreign object. So I think the difference between raw material and finished object is one which bring in potentially very different scenarios. So that one should not just group it together. I grouped it together in that slide to give you a sense of the volume, but I think one could then again differentiate it in terms of what kind of interaction and what kind of impact and the ability to appropriate it. I think when you get flint raw material in, you can appropriate it as your own objects. If you have, if you get uh, amber in, it's much more open question to me at least what actually happened in the incorporation of that into your local worldviews. So I think you're pointing to important distinction. Yes, I think that's that's what we are missing in many publications. Uh, when you say, oh, we have this and this many amber objects or gold objects or whatever, it depends. It's sometimes in, in a certain grace, for example, we find both things. We find very, uh, very delicate and, and uh, sophisticated products of um, amber workshops, which are imported as such. And yeah. then you find a necklace of 
big chunks of amber. The first one says, look who do I know? And the other one says, look how much amber I can get. Yeah. And it's a completely different story. But if you would just see the, the, the table with, with the numbers, it would be so and so many amber beads. It doesn't say these three are probably equally important as 333 of, of, of uh, different kind, or are, at least they are telling different, different story. Yeah. Okay, I think we should finish now because sessions are starting now. So we have to, um, we have to probably chase our uh, uh, viewers. Uh, and thank you again, Marie Louise, for this very, very uh, inspiring lecture. And I think we'll talk about it more. Uh, everyone should know that uh, these uh, keynote lectures will be available later uh, in terms of uh, as, as uh, taped uh, lectures, so you can go through it again. And yeah, I wish you luck to all the sessions and Marie-Louise, I hope to see you very soon uh, in, in circumstances where we co could go for a beer. Yeah, uh, that won't start too long for that, isn't that? Wouldn't that be? I see all the names of so wonderful people who I would have loved to talk with. So you feel really sense of regret on losing, not having this opportunity. But thank you so much. And thank you very much for your questions. It's been really rewarding to get a sense of responses. That is that is why we talk and write and think is to engage with each other. So thank you so much. Bye. Bye.